My name is Honor Fisher. Um, I am from the Colorado River Indian Tribes in Parker, Arizona. Um, I am a victim services coordinator for the Pueblo of Jemez. Um, I came here a few, a couple months ago. Um, I was a uh, crime victim advocate in Parker, and I've been in the work for more than 11 years, going on 12 years. Um, I started out as a victim, or not a victim, but as a volunteer um, here in Albuquerque for the Urban Indian Advocacy Program. And I was volunteering um, while I was a victim. And um, I guess my story starts from when I was really young. I was, um, I was a victim of physical abuse, and I was also a victim of sexual abuse. And it was my stepfather. And it took me a long time to be OK with saying, he raped me. As a child, I was raped. And it's funny because today, talking to another person, we talked about some of the childhood trauma that we went through. And he you know, told me some of his things, and I talked about mine. But it made me realize, because we talked about triggers, and we talked about the things that happened to us and what triggers us can be something so minuscule. It can be a smell. It can be a sound. It can be anything, a color, a flower, something. And I was telling him that French cut green beans trigger me. Because I remember sitting at a table eating food and my brother being beaten because my brother didn't want to eat the green beans. And me, when he walked away from the table, grabbing my brother's food and shoving the green beans into my mouth so that my brother would not get hit again. And when I was young, I, my mother was the one that was working all the time. So my mother wasn't there. And I tried to tell somebody. And the result of me trying to tell someone what was going on was that my brother was punished to punish me. He took my brother into the tub and proceeded to hold my brother underwater and tell me, this is what happens when you try to tell people what's going on. You don't talk about what happens in this house. And multiple times, bringing my brother up so my brother could catch a breath and then shoving him back under the water until his ears started bleeding. And it silenced me for years. And in high school, my mother finally divorced him. And she remarried. And in high school, we had a traumatic event happen. And I buried everything that had happened to me. I buried the trauma that I went through, not just, in, not just when I was a kid, but the trauma that I went through in grade school from other people, my cousins, cousins that would come and they would grab me and shove me up against the wall, four of them, and they would start molesting me and they would have to have four of them to hold me against the wall so that they could do this because they knew that the moment I got away, I would fight. In high school, I was an honor roll student up until my junior year. And with that traumatic event, my grades went from A's and B's down to D's and F's. And I had a nervous breakdown because of my sister and her wanting to go to her dad, who was my abuser, and having to tell my mother what I went through as a child, having to tell my mom that he had raped me, 
was the hardest thing I ever had to do. And to go through all of that and relive those feelings all over again was hard. And I thought being able to release that would help me to release some of the pain and would help me heal. But my healing didn't come until I was in my late 30s because I left home and ended up in a very abusive relationship. It didn't start out that way. And by the time I left, I had a one-year-old daughter that I left on foot from that house with a, a bottle and a diaper. That's all I had. And a concussion and bruises around my neck and, and all of these other things that had happened. And when I went to the police, I was told, when I told them his name, the look that they exchanged because his family had money. And then they told me, unless you're in the hospital dying, we can't do anything for you. And it was hard. I went home and I was ashamed of everything that happened to me. And you would think that somewhere in there I'd find the way to heal. And I still didn't heal. And then I went on to have another child. And then I got into another relationship. And I thought, you know, he's not physically abusive. I'm OK. But emotional abuse is just worse than physical abuse. You know, because physical abuse, you have scars. You can see the scars, and you can remember. But emotional abuse, you don't see those scars. You don't see the damage that it inflicts on you until later. You don't realize that you go from being one kind of person to another person. You don't realize what it takes away from you. And for me, I was dealing with all of that. And, you know, we had people in our family talked about violence. And an uncle who killed his wife and killed himself. But nobody talked about the violence that went on between the two of them. And when I was, I was in my early 30s, and I was living here in New Mexico, and my mother called me and told me that one of the girls that I grew up with had died. And she you know, was crying on the phone with me, and she told me, she said on her, her ex killed her in front of their kids. And every single memory I had of her came flooding in. And all the thoughts about her and about the children she left behind, you know, and then my mother having to tell me that he killed her in front of their children and made them watch her die just broke me again. And I thought, this is wrong. This is wrong to see this happening. And I thought, I got to go do something. I can't carry this weight. And so I started volunteering. And I realized that I was in a place that I didn't need to be. And I decided to get out of my relationship. And I left and went back home and took a job as an advocate. And I started working the work, and at the same time trying to heal myself. Because I think, you know, it's funny because advocates, a lot of us do this work because of our own trauma. And we, well, at least for me, I, I thought, if I can just save one woman 
from having to go through everything that I went through or from having herself, from having to die because of the person that she's with. If I can just save one, then I'll have accomplished something. Then my life will mean something. And even in doing all of that, I still realized that I was not healed. And it took me forever to get to that point to, to realize that I needed to heal. And I didn't understand how to gauge knowing when I had gotten past a certain point until a couple of years ago. Because for the longest time I had so much anger inside and my abuser died and I never got the chance to confront him. But I was angry all the time and I all the time wanted to go take a shotgun and a box full of shells to the cemetery and fill his his grave with buckshot because I thought maybe if I do that that'll make me heal you know and I kept saying that if I can do that maybe that'll help me heal maybe I'll feel a little bit better and I never got the chance to do it but it wasn't until a few years ago that I started talking to a friend of mine and we started talking about the work that we do and she told me you know you have to listen to this woman talk and, and I always butcher those ladies name that um, Ilyana Vizant whatever her name is that motivational speaker and she had written something and I printed it out and I put it on my on my desk at work and I had to look at it every day and it said until you heal the wounds of the past, you are going to bleed. And I looked at that every day. And I would always look at it and think, how am I supposed to heal something that feels like it'll never heal? How am I going to take that pain out if I can't confront that man for what he did to me? Because I, you know, I don't think the buckshot is going to be enough. I don't think that that's going to fix my problem. Because he's taken so much of my life away from me. And then I realized it wasn't him that I had to forgive. And it wasn't anybody else that I had to forgive. It was me. Because I blamed myself for being weak, for being broken and I realized that until I forgave myself I was never going to heal and it took I'd like to say it was an easy thing but it wasn't but there came a day where I felt good and I could look at myself in the mirror and be okay and find things about me that I was happy with because I couldn't look in a mirror for a long time without saying you know why are you here what good are you doing what are you accomplishing and so you know I, I know that being broken isn't the end of the world for me. And I know that I've made a difference in advocacy because there are people that come to me and tell me, I'm glad you talk about your story. I'm glad that you talk about the things that happened to you because it makes it easier for me to know that there's somebody out there who knows what's going on in my life. I went into this work because it was something that I felt like I had to do because I didn't want another person dead, somebody that I cared about. And I think for us as advocates, you know, it's what makes us good at what we do. 
It really does. I wish that I could say that time heals all wounds, but it doesn't. But as people, as women, as Indian women, even with all the trauma that we've gone through, because we know, just like the lady before me said, you know, We are resilient. We are, we come from people who don't want to talk, but yet somehow we are here and we remain, even with all the trauma that we've been through. And there's a lot of trauma and our people don't want to talk about it, but it's our voices, our strength, and our ability to overcome everything that we have gone through, every obstacle that we have faced, it is us that will make the difference, that will make the change. And it may take us a while, but we're gonna fight, and we will continue to be those voices. Because I refuse to let my pain be silent and I refuse to let other women and let my daughters suffer. I will not continue to be that step that my family goes down. That staircase, it stops with me. And that blood that comes down those stairs is going to stop with me because I will not watch my children, my daughters or my son, let that blood flow anymore. We will not be silenced and we will not let our daughters and our sons be those victims anymore those victims that stayed voiceless. Because our elders went through so much, they gave us that burden, that trauma that's in our genes. It has a name and it has so much to do with us now that it's not gonna be that way anymore. And as God is my witness, I'm going to make sure that every woman that I know that has gone through this type of trauma has a voice. Even if she can't speak, I'll speak for her. Because I won't carry this burden alone. And I will not give it to my children. <clears throat>